second 18 holes of golf at this time. Uh, but now if any of you are, if I see any of you dropping off, I'm gonna bring Jacob up here and say Alu Akbar a few times. The, I wanna give special thanks to my wife, Pam, who uh, has put in, uh, among other people, has put in uh, a lot of hours with registrations and things, and there's many other people that everybody else that's volunteered needs to be thanked greatly, too. Uh, the joke around our house is I'm an early riser. My wife is nocturnal. So even though we've been married 39 years, we've really only been together for five. <laughs> so, and thus far, it's working out pretty good. So, um, you know, she's, I'm in bed and she's down, you know, she, about 11 o'clock, she gets like a shot of adrenaline or something. One of the things we're doing right now at uh, Fellowship Bible Chapel is we're doing a study on the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be doing uh, Pergamum. Uh, the joke around Fellowship Bible Chapel is that, you know, John is a little slow at getting through a book. And that uh, if I ever get to the 70th week of Daniel, it'll be in real time, so it'll take 2,520 days. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing the church at Pergamon, the, the church where Satan dwells, uh, where the great altar of Zeus was that eventually was the inspiration for Albert Speer, the uh, Nazi archi the architect in that, of Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, uh, to erect... Uh, essentially a replica of that for Hitler. And we'll talk a little bit about that each uh, next week, Church at Pergamum. Uh, I do, most weeks I do a prophecy update for the church, just looking at uh, current events. I review about uh, 50 newspapers uh, on a pretty much daily basis, a number of periodicals, uh, discernment websites and that sort of thing and try to dis distill all of that down into uh, an hour. It, it doesn't work very well. It's the, the one thing that, uh, but if you would like to see those, if you would go to our website and you just type in, or go to YouTube and type in FB Chapel and hit search, hit enter, it should pull up our, our YouTube page where we have all of our sermons and prophecy updates and teachings and that type of thing, all available there on the internet. So just go to youtube.com, type in FB Chapel, and you should be able to pull it up. One of the things that we talk a lot about at our church, and I've been working for many years trying to depict it graphically. I know David, I know Jacob, I know a lot of people who are, you know, dev have devoted their lives to the faithful teaching of Bible prophecy. Every single one of them that I talk to now, the first thing that they talk about is, can you believe what's going on? Everything is converging. And so I've been trying to depict that graphically, that all of these lines of Bible prophecy are converging at a point, the point at which will ultimately result in the second coming of Jesus Christ and the setting up of his millennial kingdom here on the earth and him ruling and reigning from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Uh, there is a tremendous amount going on. I was with Bill Koenig about four weeks ago, White House correspondent, a good friend, and he just says, I'm, I'm wearing out because I cannot keep up with everything that's going on. Uh, Obama alone is a, is a full-time job for him. <laughs> now, I've tried to depict this um, and I, to show that as we get closer to the end, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy will accelerate. It happened at Jesus' first coming. A lot of the Bible prophecies related to his first coming were fulfilled in the last week of his life between Palm Sunday and the resurrection, uh, probably over, over 50%. It'll probably be the same way at the end. There will be almost an exponential increase now, one of the ways that I've thought this, let's uh, take my good friend, Mike Clapham, and let's chain, this is Yankee Stadium, and let's chain him to the top row at Yankee Stadium. Now, this is a particularly good graphic for me. I grew up in Northeast Ohio in an abusive sports fan relationship known as Cleveland Indians baseball. <laughs> and, um, 
But let's say that we take an eyedropper and we go out to second base and the, the, the stadium is completely sealed up and we're gonna drop one drop of water every minute and then the next minute two drops of water then the next four drops of water, okay? And that water does not go away. It just keeps increasing. How long does Mike Clapham have to get free? He has less than 50 minutes. In less than 50 minutes, the stadium will be completely full of water. That's an example of exponential growth. Another example would be if you fold paper in half, just a regular sheet of paper, and you could continue to fold it. At about 15 folds, that paper will be as, uh, around 20 folds, that paper will be as tall as the Empire State Building. On about the 30th fold, or 28th fold, it will reach all the way to the moon. And the next fold will get you all the way back from the moon. That's a concept, that's sort of an example of exponential growth. And that's, a, I think, a pretty good picture of how Bible prophecy is going to unfold from this point forward. I don't think there's any turning back. I'm convinced that this is the time, and people need to get busy ordering their lives. We look at a number of things at Bible prophecy, uh, at uh, FP Chapel from Bible prophecy. For example, this is a recent report that was released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And all joking aside that you know, government intelligence is not necessarily a, 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 a coherent term. Um, the Financial Times picked this up in an article this week, the Financial Times in London, how the best of times is making way for the worst. And they're talking about all these different trends that are happening in the world. Now they've been tracking this for many years Back in uh, 2000, before 9-11, they issued a report. They, about every five years or so, they've been issuing a report. So this year's report is projecting what the world's going to be like in 2030. But to show you how things have changed, go back to 2000, pre-9-11, the big terrorism event that we've had is the 1998 bombings of the embassy in Nairobi, Kenya, American embassy by Al-Qaeda. Uh, and some other terrorist attacks, but 9-11 in New York has not happened. But in their report back in 2000, this is what they said about Russia. Have you heard a little bit about Russia in the news the last couple weeks? This is what they said 15 years ago. This is what they projected would be like in 2015. So here we are in 2014, so how did they do? Russia will be unable to maintain conventional forces that are both sizable and modern or to project significant military power with conventional means. The Russian military will increasingly rely on its shrinking strategic and theater nuclear arsenals to deter, or if deterrence fails, to counter large-scale conventional assaults on Russian territory. How did they do on that? How was their prediction? Not very good. Uh, it's an indication that as things begin to unfold, they'll unfold rapidly, and they may challenge a lot of the assumptions that we've made, particularly about Bible prophecy. Things change. I remember when the Soviet Union fell in 1989, everybody said, oh, you crazy people who believe in Bible prophecy that think that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about a Russian invasion of uh, leading a coalition of nations to invade Israel. See, that's not going to happen. We don't need to believe Bible prophecy. Is it more likely now than it was before the fall of the Soviet Union with Vladimir Putin? I think it probably is. So there's other reports that have been issued. Um, in the new report, they talk about certain things that they project that are on the near horizon. Certainly will, could happen between now and 19, uh, 2030. Uh, for example, a severe pandemic, right, outbreak of a disease. Does that have any real, I, what I always find fascinating is when secular people pick up on themes of Bible prophecy when they don't even realize it. Euro-EU collapse. Uh, solar geomagnetic storms. 
nuclear war or a weapon of mass destruction or a cyber attack. All of those things. And then there's one other country that they specifically called out as very significant in the development of things over the next uh, 15 years, and that's the nation of Iran. Does the nation of Iran have anything to do with Bible prophecy? Here's what they've said. They're hopeful. And actually, there are prophetic passages that talk about what eventually will happen to the people in Persia. But this is what they say. A more liberal regime could come under growing public pressure to end the in international sanctions and negotiate an end to Iran's isolation. An Iran that dropped its nuclear weapons aspirations and became focused on economic modernization would bolster the chances for a more stable Middle East. Again, that sort of shows that the term government intelligence is not necessarily an accurate description. But Persia is a major player in the end times. Then it talks about, uh, there's a section called alternative worlds, ways, things that, where they could go. Uh, and it says this in this, this clip from this uh, uh, intelligence report. We have more than enough information to suggest that however rapid change has been over the past couple of decades, the rate of change will accelerate in the future. Accordingly, we have created four scenarios that represent distinct pathways for the world out to 2030. Stalled engines, fusion, genie out of the bottle, and non-state world. And they go through and they analyze these different scenarios. And in many respects, it lines up very well with what the biblical prophets were saying 2,500 years ago. And again, I would say when secular people begin to pick up on themes of Bible prophecy, the church needs to be aware. But sadly, much of the church is not. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Things are changing. Uh, I believe that the church worldwide is on the verge of a time of very severe testing and trial. It's already happening in many parts of the world. It may come to America. Certainly, the, the country deserves it. We get the leaders we deserve. We have the leaders now that we deserve. Uh, this is a report. This is from Ferndale, Michigan. A, uh, about how the, that school in Ferndale. Now, this went through a public vetting process. The school board considered it, voted on it, and put this policy in place about how they were going to fill, fill, uh, fill vacancies for school teachers. And this is what it says. Special consideration shall be given to women and or minority defined as Native American, Asian American, Latino, African American, and those of the non-Christian faith. That is America in 2014. These people should be fired. And if you live in Ferndale, you probably need to get your kids out of that school. I believe it's time when the, I, as I look at things, look, we're a little church. Somebody on the internet last night was asking, how big is this church? Well, we started uh, as a Bible study just about a year ago in, in early April, mid-April. Uh, in mid-June, we started up as a church. We run 65, 75, 80 people uh, on a Sunday. We're not that big. With technology, though, and I've noticed this thing through social media, the remnant is identifying itself and connecting. I mean, last night, I, know, I don't know what the exact stats were, but I know we had over 1,000 people watching live stream. And like I said, we're just a little church in, in Columbus, Ohio. So the technology, while it's available now, is important. And I think uh, people in the church, they need to take advantage of it. I know that there's tremendous amounts of sermons of Jacob and David and Jack Hibbs and those things. People ought to be downloading them and saving them in the event that we lose access to the internet. You can collect with other believers and you have built-in 
good solid Bible teaching. It's available and I see this, I see the remnant self-identifying. It's very exciting to see uh, as people are identifying themselves. But the church is in a mess. I'm sure, I don't know if Jacob is gonna mention this, but World Vision. Y'all heard the story about World Vision this week, I'm sure that they will no longer require more than uh, 1,100, it's more than 1,100 employees to restrict their sexual activity to marriage between one man and one woman. Now, World Vision has really been off the track for a long time. Now, they've reversed this policy, but before they reversed it, because they were losing donations, follow the money, the head of this said, Stearns asserts that the very narrow policy change should be viewed by others as symbolic, not of compromise, but of Christian unity. He even hopes it will inspire unity elsewhere among Christians. And what you see in the church, it's bad. And it, I know from, I'm an attorney, I talk to people in different corporations, and they are getting close to where they're going to be forced to continue, if they want to continue their employment, to sign statements that not only will they not discriminate, but they will actively, publicly affirm homosexual marriage. And I think Christians are going to start losing their jobs. It's coming. And the church, the remnant church, needs to step up and help out in those situations. Need to identify and get things together. Um, Stearns also said this, this is not an endorsement of same-sex marriage. He tried to argue that they didn't take a position, but by not taking a position, they took a position. <laughs> this is the, I'll talk about this, this, this cognitive dissonance that people live with in just a moment. We have decided we are not going to get into that debate. This is not us compromising. It is us deferring to the authority of churches and denominations on theological issues. We're an operational arm of the global church. We're not a theological arm of the church. Well, if theology is not important, you're not part of the church. And I would suggest that instead of the name World Vision, they ought to change it to Worldly Vision. <laughs> now, we... Um, David uh, Hawking lived here until 1968, and when he had the chance to get out to California, he fled. Uh, because of spring, this is supposedly spring out there, and uh, they do, this doesn't happen in California. My friend Jack Hibbs will send me a text every now and then, I'm freezing at 63. <laughs> I'm like, grow up, man. And, um, and I love California. There's a lot of great believers, great churches out there. Uh, it's great weather. The golf is great. I mean, it's, but their politicians are crazy. They're insane. So we kind of have the best advantage. We can go out there for six to eight weeks a year to my in-laws, and we don't have to pay the taxes, you know, the income taxes and stuff. But we know about Proposition 8. We also know that they have this gender bathroom law uh, this is a report that was on uh, the news in Riverside, California, just the other night. So we're going to take a shot at this. We're going to maybe have to adjust the sound, but listen to this. Micah, share a bit of mixed reaction at this meeting tonight. You had some parents who applauded this and others who were outraged and felt like teachers should have been paying closer attention. For some super severe negli uh, negligence. Many asked, how could this happen on campus? The principal at John Adams Elementary School in Rip that multiple assaults happened between 2012 and 2013. The initial investigation indicates that incidents occurred in a bathroom and in a classroom. One boy allegedly coerced another boy to perform sex acts. Both are in third grade. Based on applause, you could tell most parents continue to support their school. That child's a victim too, but he learned it from somewhere. And it's not, every, I mean, that's not behavior that, that the school taught. But many questioned how their teacher didn't notice. He should have stood out, stood out, you know, like a sore thumb. 
A spokesperson for Riverside Unified School District couldn't go into detail, but did confirm two teachers at Adams have been put on paid administrative leave, which is normal protocol. Whitney Ramos's son was in the same classroom with the two boys. She says the blaming needs to stop. It's not the teacher. The children didn't even know. So these two little boys basically kept it to themselves until Monday. That's when students say the accused boy started telling other kids. The district says three kids who were not involved told an adult. The principal called police the same day Child Protective Services is also investigating. We are very proud of these kids for being brave enough and having the courage to come forward. Now, the school principal also told the group that police believe there are only two students involved, but counselors are talking to the other children to see if they can identify any other potential victims. We're live in Riverside. Kimberly Chang, KTLA 5 News. Okay, two third grade boys were engaging in sex acts in a classroom and bathroom at a public school. This is what happens over and over again in California. This is what happens when churches in the emerging church win marriage and for traditional marriage. When people like uh, Andy Stanley, probably the pastor of this, can speak out against homosexuality despite being asked multiple times to do so. In fact, he said people who won't bake a cake because of their religion need to leave Jesus out of it. That's a direct quote of what that man, there's a vineyard church up in Ann Arbor where the pastor, a large church, vineyard church in Ann Arbor, where the pastor last week came out in favor of homosexual marriage. When the church won't stand up or people who claim to be Christians won't stand up against this nonsense, this is what's going to happen. And it's going to, California, I'm afraid, is a bellwether state in our country. And it will not stay there. In Romans 1, God laid it out that if you give yourselves over to this, God eventually gives up on you and turns you over to all kinds of vile passions. And it's happening, it's happening just as Romans 1 said it would. The pattern is there. Now, that's a pattern of the end times, as Jacob has taught. Jesus said in Luke 17 that it would be like the days of Lot. And go read 2 Peter 2 about Lot and what he was like at the time before he was rescued. He was oppressed by the vile conduct of the people around him. It's coming to us. We need to be prepared for it. Now let's move across the world just real quickly. This is an interesting thing. I actually found this in Investor's Business Daily about a week ago on the editorial page. And um, they are not, uh, well, they're not Obama supporters, let's put it that way. This is the Lady of Kazan. It is the most revered icon in the, Ro uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. About 1904, the original icon was destroyed in a fire, stolen during a fire from a church in Russia. They found this replica that had been made back in the 1700s. This thing had been in existence since around 1500. They found this replica that was several hundred years old, and it was in the possession of the Blue Army of the Lady of Fatima at the Fatima Shrine uh, when they, for the, to that demonic vision that happened in Fatima, Portugal, back in the early, in, around the time of World War I. Um, it was, get, was taken to the Vatican, and Pope John Paul II put it in his private chapel, and you can see it here in the picture to the right, and he prayed to that icon every day. It was his goal, and when Vladimir Putin came to visit him about 2003, there was the icon sitting in the middle of their meeting. In 2004, August 25th, 2004, there was a, about six months before John Paul passed, uh, they had a ceremony at St. Peter's to venerate the icon. Three days later, it was given to a cardinal. John Paul II wanted to take it to Russia himself, but his health didn't permit. A cardinal took it and presented it to the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. 
John Paul later died, and this man who was called a great evangelist by some evangelical Christians was buried in a coffin that had the symbol on it, a T and an M. It was totus tuus Mary, totally yours, Mary. This is what that man, supposedly a great evangelist, felt it was necessary to put on the box that he was buried in. So the icon was taken, it was put in this church in the Kremlin. What's interesting is that Vladimir Putin is very much tied to the Russian Orthodox Church. This icon in a Polish war in the 1600s and in other wars in the 1700s and then before the Napoleonic War in the 1800s in Russia when Russia defeated Napoleon, that icon was brought out to bless the troops in battle. About a month ago, Vladimir Putin took that icon from a Rus this Russian Orthodox Church and flew it around the Black Sea in Crimea. I only raise this to point out that when we think it's just geopolitics, it's very often ignored that there's a very heavy religious component to things that are going on. And Vladimir Putin, you are naive if you think anything other than Vladimir Putin being tied to the Russian Orthodox Church is good for Israel. The Russian Orthodox Church is one of the most uh, violently, publicly anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish organizations on the planet. Stalin probably killed more Jews, I don't have any doubt that he killed more Jews than Hitler. So, what does all this have to do? Well, turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to read a passage and then we'll talk a little bit about some things that are going on in the church relative to the study of Bible prophecy. Peter, writing his second epistle, says this in verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 3. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. And as we read this, there's a, a big new epic blockbuster movie out about that. A uh, Jewish uh, movie reviewer that I read last night an attorney up in Detroit that writes movie reviews on her blog said, that thing should be called Not Noah. <laughs> Verse 7, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So back in verse 3, we see this. Know first of all that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. The word there is mockers, a uh, Greek word, I'm not even going to try to say it because David's much, he'll correct me. It means scoffers, it's also, that's what's used in the King James. People will mock Bible prophecy in the end times. That is the time that we live in right now. By and large, the church, the professing evangelical church, is abandoning Bible prophecy. As the signs begin to file up, pile up, as things converge, as more things happen, it's talked about less and less in what were formerly good churches. I received a draft of a statement of faith for an evangelical fellowship this week that essentially has removed almost all references to eschatology. It's unbelievable. It's everywhere. And 
I would say that if you're in a church that's abandoned it, you need to abandon it. In Jude, it talks about this, this word mockers. Jude 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last time there will be mockers falling after their own ungodly lust. It's the same language, essentially, that Peter used and here it is repeated in June, following after their own ungodly lusts. I'm going to play a couple clips of people that are talking about Bible prophecy. Uh, they're available on the Internet. That's a beautiful thing about the Internet now. People can't hide. When Brian Halston down at uh, Hillsong Church talks about Islam and, and Christianity worshiping the same God and then tries to back off of that position, and confused, it shows even more that he's massively confused on the issue. It's nice to have the internet to expose these people for what they really say. First person I'm going to show is Greg Boyd. Greg Boyd is pastor at Woodland Hills Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's one of the leading proponents of something called open theism. Open theism essentially says that God doesn't know the future. He's going to be as surprised as to how things unfold as anyone. Here's a beginning part of his sermon recently on the book of Revelation. I, I know this is a perspective that is new to most folks. It's not at all new in the academic community. People who specialize in the book of Revelation have been saying this for you know, forever. But uh, um, the evangelical subculture comes out of uh, uh, the fundamentalist culture, which comes in part out of the whole apocalyptic movement of the 19th century, where they first began to read Revelation as a literal snapshot of the future. That was a new view in the 19th century, but it's become part of the evangelical culture. So most evangelicals that I've met don't even know of a different way of reading the book of Revelation. And so my burden here is to try to take the stuff which is locked up in these academic archives and communicate it here at a level that, that uh, us non-academics can understand. And if you listen to this, I, I listened to about 10 minutes of it, and then as I felt my head begin to swell up on the verge of exploding, I turned it off. The man is massively confused. He's mocking Bible prophecy. Mark Driscoll, you've heard of Mark Driscoll recently. He's had massive problems with uh, plagiarism, uh, things in his ministry, uh, bragging at a conference that behind the Mars Hills bus there's a pile of bodies and Lord willing, there'll be an even bigger pile when we get done here. A man who calls himself a shepherd in the Church of Jesus Christ brags about the bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. This is what he had to say in a message about Bible prophecy a couple years ago. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, comes unexpectedly. He says it doesn't come with a lot of signs and fanfare. It's not like before Jesus returns and the kingdom of God is unveiled and we stand before God for judgment. All of a sudden, you know, there's just banners in the sky. Tomorrow at noon, he's coming back. Note to self, get ready. It's not like that. And so what we need to do is always live preparedly. That if Jesus came back right now, we'd be ready to meet him and stand before him and give an account to him. Now, what this means is most of the garbage sold in Christian bookstores is wrong. The stuff about the end times. Because what people try to do is exactly what Jesus said we were not supposed to do, and that's take all the signs and try and put them together and predict when the end would be. People have been doing this since the days of the New Testament. The Thessalonians did this. They sold all their stuff. They put together charts, sold books, freaked everybody out, sold canned goods, and bottled water, and huddled up, and lo and behold, 2,000 years later, swinging a mess. <laughs> they didn't get it right. He didn't come back in their lifetime as they were expecting. So Paul tells them, go get a job, go to work. It's going to be a while. Hang in there. There's still kingdom work to be done. So he says it won't be with lots of signs. Now, some of you are too involved in what we'll call eschatology, which is the study of last things. You'll find somebody who reads the newspaper and, you know, follows all of the news reports and then pulls it all together and pulls something out of context from Daniel and something really scary from Jeremiah. And next thing you know, you're buying a book at the Christian bookstore and you're having nightmares and you're freaking out. You know? 
And Jesus says it's not going to be like that. So he continued. Because you don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. And it doesn't matter if they have a chart. Jesus is a look at the chart saying, well, that's not what I was thinking, but it's on the chart. It looked very official. A committee met and took a vote. I guess I got to come back then. <laughs> he really doesn't care about our charts. Okay. <laughs> now these mockers, John goes on to describe or Jude goes on to describe, and he says this. Now listen, the official word from people like Mark Driscoll and Rick Warren and everybody is eschatology is not important, don't worry about it. That is, any of that should be a red flag. Any pastor that avoids it should be a red flag to you. Because the Bible's about 27, 25, 27% prophecy. So why would you rip out 25 to 27% of it? It's how the apostles, it's how people knew that Jesus was the Messiah. It's how we'll know when the Messiah's coming back. God laid it all out for us so we wouldn't worry. So we would live our lives sanctified in expectation. As Mike Clapham pointed out to me once, go through 1 Thessalonians, every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, even over in the 2 Thessalonians, ties of belief in the second coming to the, to the way a believer sanctifies himself. You take that away, you lose, I think, your sanctification. That's why Mark Driscoll has problems. So the word is that eschatology is divisive. That's not what Jude says. When they're talking about mockers, it is the mockers, it says this, verse 19, these are the ones who cause divisions. Worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. They mock Bible prophecy. We live in a time where we have seen, some of us, some of you, have seen Israel come back into the land. 1920, there was a Palestinian mandate. That is still, by the way, the only legal document in the world body governing bodies that speaks to how the Holy Land is supposed to be split up. It's the one all the world governments voted on and approved. And that's what Israel was supposed to look like. Essentially, all of Israel now, what's incorrectly called the West Bank, it's Judea and Samaria, and the country of Jordan, or Transjordan. That's what the world government approved back in 1920, and that's never been overturned. There's a French lawyer who's done a great job researching this. In the 1940s, in a town called Vil Vilnius in um, Lithuania, the Nazi people, this is near the border of Belarus, not too far from Poland, in Lithuania, they rounded up the Jews, took them around the pit, shot them and killed them, and there's you can see the bodies of the dead children. If you go to Yad Vashem, I would highly encourage any of you to go to Israel, and you have to go to Yad Vashem. Uh, this man was involved in one of the roundup and shooting of Jews. As they started shooting people, he was just a young child. He fell in the pit and played dead before he got shot. He laid still. Eventually, after laying there for hours and hours and hours, another young man grabbed his foot, a little boy of eight, and they escaped. In 1947, they voted to uh, have a nation of Israel in the UN General Assembly. And on May 14, 1948, the state of Israel was born. And that day in Tel Aviv, which 40 years prior had looked like this, swamps and sand dunes and nothing, this is what happened on May 14, 1948. On that same Friday afternoon, 5th of ER, 5708, 
May the 14th, 1948. David Ben-Gurion arrived at the Tel Aviv Museum building. His entire life had been directed towards this very moment. This right is the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations, in their own sovereign state, which would open the gates of the homeland wide to every Jew and confer upon the Jewish people the status of a fully privileged member of the Committee of Nations. Accordingly, we members of the National Executive, representatives of the Jewish community of Eretz Israel and of the Zionist movement, are here assembled on the day of the termination of the British mandate over Eretz Israel. And by virtue of our natural and historic right, and the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, here declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. And there in Israel, in Tel Aviv that day, Israel was born. Um, at the Yad Vashem, there's, uh, I don't want to play the whole clip, but they played the Jewish National Anthem for the first time that day. At the Yad Vashem, um, I think this is called the Hall of Remembrance, um, these, the dome there is pictures of Jews killed in the Holocaust, and around the lower portion here are notebooks with a page for each Jew that they've been able to identify that was killed in the Holocaust in World War II. They only have about half of them, about three million of the six million identified. The rest are lost to history. As you exit the museum, you walk up, and you have this beautiful overlook of Jerusalem. It's a uh, very emotional thing. But we have evangelicals now that are involved in this thing, boycott, divest, and sanctions of Israel. Boycott them, don't buy their products. And I would suggest if you're not going to buy Israeli products, you don't buy anything from Israel to be consistent with your position, which means you're going to give up cell phones and a lot of other things. Somebody suggested that BDS really shouldn't be boycott, divest, and sanctions. It should be baloney, dumb, and stupid. <laughs> and you see this, this move within people who claim to be evangelicals. This is Relevant Magazine. There's an article in the current issue by Cameron Strang. He's the publisher. The article is called, Is Peace Possible? He says this, Palestinians are the descendants of the early Christians. He's quoting a supposed scholar. We are probably the straightest line to original Christianity. The Christian presence is important. Christianity is part and parcel of the Palestinian identity. The modern Palestinian Christian community traces its roots back to Pentecost, representing an unbroken Christian presence in the land of Jesus since the first disciples. Now, the purpose of an editor is to quit, is to stop an author from making stupid statements that are factually wrong. But I guess if the author is the publisher of the magazine, he gets away with it. This, this article is riddled with errors. This is a family that's very active in publications in the United, Christian publications in the United States. And they're wrong. What does the Bible say? Acts chapter 2, talking about what happened on the day of Pentecost. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. It doesn't mention Palestinians. This cognitive dissonance comes out of postmodernism. For example, 
academia is riddled with this. I remember when I was in graduate school 35 years ago, 40 years ago, a while back. <laughs> and it was, it was insane. It, it, I had a professor and that was in the office next to me and we used to talk. He thought I was crazy and I knew he was. <laughs> and um, I did a talk on relativism back in 2001 at a conference. This is a slide from that. What I talked about at that time was with the way people are growing up to not be concerned about facts or knowledge. I'm a trial lawyer by training. It's frightening to go into court and have your client's liberty or money at risk for people that think like this, that think only with their emotions. And so now every trial lawyer training seminar is not about how to present the facts. It's about how to appeal to the emotions of the jurors. Postmodernism has infected everything. It's infecting the church. It is a stupid worldview. It is self-refuting. For example, you will hear people like Brian McLaren, Rob Bell, other people, Doug Padgett, there is no absolute truth. Now, how do you refute that? One question. Do you mean that absolutely? <laughs> it's cognitive dissonance. There was recently a, um, the third Christ at the Checkpoint conference in Bethlehem just uh, two weeks ago. Went for five days. Uh, actually, we have about the same attendance here that they did there, in case you're wondering. But notice what was on the backdrop to this conference. Coexistence. This, you, I'm sure you've seen the bumper sticker. You know, it's usually the people they've got you know, save the earth, save the whales, you know, all that stuff. One of the leading proponents of that is Bono. In 2009 at the Willow Creek Leadership Summit, Bill Hybels interviewed Bono, played an interview that he did with Bono for evangelical leaders. This is one of the most influential evangelical organizations. Bill Hybels, about two years ago, went to the Catalyst Conference with Andy Stanley in Atlanta and was interviewed by Greg Groeschel. That's Greg Groeschel on the right, Andy Stanley on the left. Uh, and they interviewed Bill about, Bill, what do you like about young leaders in the church and what do you not like? Now, this is the man who, next to Rick Warren, has been the most influential person in evangelical uh, circles over the last 25 years. There are thousands of Willow Creek churches. Go to their website, they're all, they're all over this neighborhood, they're Willow Creek churches. So this is Bill Hybels speaking in an interview with Greg Rushel. What's wrong, what do I like, and what do I not like? This is about two minutes, listen to this. What do you see in that generation that you're most excited about? And then what, um, what would be a concern that you'd like to speak into? Uh, generally, uh, in the younger leaders that I'm seeing coming into uh, Kingdom Play these days, um, it, it, it's almost like uh, innate in them, it appears to me anyway, uh, for them to be missional. Mm -hmm. My gosh. I mean, we used to have to do whole series, you know, six weeks long to, 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 to get an average Christian to think about the poor or to, to, or, or to become active in some way to overcome some terrible injustice. I mean, it, it used to be such hard work to, to get someone, uh, you know, converted, if you will, to a conscience of social activism. Man, most of the young pastors that I see uh, anxious to get into the vineyard, you know, to do God's work, they, they feel it. They, they bleed it. They've, they've got mission all over them. They're, they, you know, yeah, they, they feel it. It's in them. Uh, I celebrate that more than you would know. That's a huge change from the day uh, when I was first starting out. Now, 
what, what I get a little concerned about, uh, it, it actually, uh, is the theology of, of a lot of young pastors who are uh, coming into play these days. Because uh, th- there's such odd varieties of theologies out there these days, and every one of the blog can have one. And so th- there's this, this kind of uh, piecemeal, uh, call it what you will, name it what you want, thing that, get, that gets uh, talked about that, is, it, that I find in some cases is not coherent and, and, and is not consistent with the New Testament as I understand it. So I think the need for theological training, and, and, and not just the one time where you get your ticket punched, but I mean th- theological rigor, uh, th- theological inspection or, or reflection in, in groups where you actually get a group of pastors together and you say, let's spend three days working through this, that, or the other thing. And I would say that there's probably no one more responsible for that state of the evangelical church and pastors in the evangelical church than Bill Hybels and his seeker-sensitive model that he got from Peter Drucker, same place that Rick Warren went. And I think rather than lamenting it, he probably needs to repent and change. But there's been no change. And this has had a massive negative impact on the evangelical church. Well, this conference and uh, this Christ at the Checkpoint conference, Lynn Hybels, his wife, spoke there uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I don't have time to play the clips that I have from this. Gary Burge was there. He's sort of the resident theologian of these Christian Palestinians, you can go and look up Paul Wilkinson's books on the internet and find out what's going on there. You can go, I would go watch these, a couple of these videos. They're available on Vimeo. Just type in Christ at the checkpoint. But, um, you know, if you're prone to aneurysms or head exploding, you probably want to wear a helmet or something while you do this. Uh, But they just, um, Gary Burge has been exposed as a false, his books are false. They, camera, a committee for accuracy in Middle East reporting in America did a, a number of exposés of errors, gross factual errors in his book. And this was the provost of Wheaton. This is his response to this. Mr. Van Zyl, thank you for your letter of concern. After careful study of your expressed concerns, I find insufficient basis on which to respond in any formal way to faculty member Professor Gary Burge. The matters of concern which you address are extraordinarily complex. To describe the causation of such historically complex events and articulate their meaning and ethical implications as you and as both you and Dr. Burge do in your writing always involves interpretation and selective presentation of issues. Whether or not I agree with his conclusions, this is so typical of people Whether or not I agree with his conclusions, what you have documented is that there are different possible interpretations of these events based on attributing different significance to possibly related events. You have not documented that Dr. Burge engaged in the the kind of dishonesty, plagiarism, or other unethical behavior that would require any administrative action. Folks, I'm not even scratching the surface. We talk about this at Fellowship Bible Chapel all the time because we need to warn people that these people are massively confused. And one of the the leading indicators of their confusion and their false teaching is how they view Israel and how they view Bible prophecy. And when somebody won't talk about it or mocks it, you need to avoid that person. And if that's a church you're in, I'm sorry, you need to get out and go find a fellowship where this is emphasized and taught faithfully from the scriptures. There are still churches out there. I know of many, but they're becoming fewer and fewer. But it's time for the remnant to get together and identify them and reject 
the mockers of Bible prophecy. It is one of the best indicators that we are living in the, in the last times. And it's growing. David and Jacob talk about it all the time. That, that trend, replacement theology and other things related to it, they have conferences about it, and it's a sign that Jesus is coming back. And we all need to get ready. Should I pray? Let's pray. Father, keep us in your word. Keep us faithful. Have people hold their shepherds. Give them the courage to hold their shepherds accountable to faithfully proclaim your soon return. Lord, bless all these people here and those listening today. Bless uh, David and Jacob as they come to speak uh, later today. And help us guard our hearts in these days. In Jesus' name, amen.